Uh, thanks, Simon, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. I normally, in this room, lecture on Keats and Blake and Wordsworth. This is a bit strange for me to be talking about something quite different, but uh, hopefully you'll bear with me. And what I want to do, although I want to get to a kind of a sense of a possible future, as I'm suggesting, I also want to spend most of the time tonight talking about the present that we're in, in order to understand how to imagine what the limits are for us imagining uh, possible alternatives uh, to the present. And the way I want to proceed is, instead of, instead of the normal kind of political analysis that begins by you know, trying to sort of abstractly depict where we are, and where we can go from here, and so on, uh, which is easy enough to do, but it's not necessarily that interesting over and over and over again. Uh, what I want to do is proceed instead by offering a series of snapshots of where we are now, and then building on the snapshots to say, well, so what does this tell us about the situation we're in, in terms of Israel and Palestine, what, and then hence, what possible futures there might be to resolve what I think to agree is of an unacceptable present and recent past. So the first snapshot I want to offer you is from the West Bank, from a town called Ezba Jalud, which is in the north of the West Bank, the northwest of the West Bank, in fact. Uh, it runs up against the wall that Israel has been building uh, that, you know, some people say it's between the West Bank and Israel, but in fact, as you probably know, most of the wall is actually built inside the West Bank, separating parts of the West Bank from other parts of the West Bank, and that's what this first snapshot is about. So if you look at the town of Papilia in the northwest of the map here, uh, Ezra Jagud is just south of Papilia. You can see it perhaps better here. It's the northwest town in this map, which is the same inset area. So the red line is the wall, which looks like this in this part of Palestine. Uh, and the story concerns a man called Muhammad Jalud, who's a farmer, who lives in the town of Ezra Jalud, the town, like I said, in the northwest of the map here. Uh, who's a small farmer, as many people in that part of Palestine are. You know, he grows cucumbers and tomatoes and lettuce and that kind of thing. In the old days, meaning until the wall went up, he had a 10 minute walk from his house to his fields, very, very close. The wall that Israel constructed in that part of the West Bank, um, first of all, intrudes heavily far into, into, West Bank, into the West Bank itself, not just on the 1967 border, the Green Line, which is to the west, the green line to the west here. Uh, and it separated Muhammad's farm, his crops, from where he lived, which of course made his life as a farmer much more difficult since he had a very hard time getting to and from his, his farm. There was a gate that the Israelis built in the wall right near his town. It's the north, it's the first crossing, the very top of the map, the top left. Uh, it's a gate, you know, literally between the town of Ezra Jalud and, and the town's fields, which are on the other side of the wall that the Israelis built. However, the gate there was closed to Palestinians. So Muhammad couldn't use that gate to get to his land. So he had to go south to the gate of Azun Atma, which is uh, one, two, three gates further down. You can see all the, the, the green dots of the gate. So it's, you just track down. It's about an hour for him to walk down to Azun Atma. Then he was able to cross through the gate of Azun Atma to the other side of the wall, go all the way back up, the other side of the wall, back up to where his, his fields are. And he did that for a while, even though it took him an hour, and even though in order to get through the Azun Atma gate, he needed a permit from the Israeli army, uh, and he needed a permit to bring a donkey in, and the Israeli army refused to let him bring in his tractor, meaning he had to carry stuff on his back, literally, up and down this entire walk on the western side of the wall in West Bank territory. Gradually, things got more difficult because the Israeli army started opening and closing the gates more erratically. So, for example, if he had an hour of watering to do, for example, he might have to be stuck five hours on the other side of the wall waiting for the gate to reopen to get back out. And then in mid-2004, the Israelis opened the Ezra Jadu gate, the one that's near his house, the top left here, which he thought meant, okay, now I could at least walk through the gate, so now it's back to the 10-minute walk from my house to my field should be easier. The problem was that his permit was for the Azun Atma gate, the other gate. So he said, well, okay, I'll go talk to the soldiers there and try to explain to them. So he went to the soldiers there, the Israeli soldiers, and they said, no, you can't use this gate anymore because there's a gate closer to your house up there. 
say to get my permits for this gate. He said, well, you can apply for the permit for the other gate. So he applied for a permit for the other gate and was declined three, four times in a row. So for about a year, he was stuck in this Cat 22 with a gate that he could physically use, he didn't have a permit to use, and the gate that he had a permit to use, he wasn't physically allowed to use. Which meant, of course, that he lost a year's worth of crops. He ended up having to do part-time manual labor just to keep himself going. And he came very close to losing control over his land. All of which is very important because under Israeli military regulations, if Palestinians don't tend their lands, the Israeli army can say, you're not tending your land, it's now state land. So we take, so they basically reinterpreted all the law to basically reappropriate land. They do that all the time. So a farmer not tending his land is not just a matter of immediate concern for his livelihood, as it was certainly the case for Muhammad, but also concern for losing his land forever because the army can just take it and say it's ours now. Even though, of course, they're creating the circumstances of preventing him getting to his land and tending it in the first place. But his story is not obviously unique to him. The gap between the wall and the 67 border, what the Israeli army calls the seam zone, contains about 10% of the West Bank and it, by far the most fertile land. About 60,000 Palestinians live in the, in the gap between the wall and the border. And the Israeli army declared this area a closed military area, which according to Israeli army regulations officially means that nobody's allowed to enter it other than Israelis. And the Israeli army regulations specifically define Israelis to mean not just Israeli citizens or residents, but anyone, and I quote, eligible for the law of, to, for immigration to Israel under the law of return. Which means that anybody Jewish from anywhere in the world can go to this part of land that Muhammad Ali, who owns the land and who farms there and depends on the farm for his daily subsistence, can't get to anymore because it's been declared a closed military area by the Israeli army. Other than the 60,000 Palestinians who live in this seam area, whose lives, as you can imagine, have been turned upside down, there are a further 100,000 Palestinians who live on near the wall. People like Muhammad who need to come and go either to get to their farms inside the seam area or in order to get out from the seam area back to, let's say, schools or hospitals or other parts of the world on the eastern side of the wall. All of which requires obtaining permits in the Israeli army all of which the Israeli army makes extraordinarily difficult for Palestinians to obtain. By a couple of years ago, of the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Palestinian farmers living on the east side of the wall, who are applying to the Israelis to access their own land on the west side of the wall that the Israelis, of course, put there, 18% were granted permits to do so. The rest were denied permits to access their own land. And like I said, what that means is you don't access your land, you're not tending it, you're not tending it, the army says, hey, you're not tending your land. If you're not tending your land, it becomes state land. It becomes expropriated and then ultimately colonized and settled and so forth. Some numbers help clarify this, I think. In the village of Arabuna near Janine, about 300 farmers applied for access to their land on the other side of the wall. Ten of the 300 were granted permits by the Israeli army. The village of Anin, 1,000 farmers applied for permits to access and on the other side of the wall, 75 were granted permits. I mean, it, it, this is obviously monumentally devastating for anybody living anywhere in this area. If you also look at the, the, the nature of the wall, you can see that what it's trying to do is to, uh, to draw a line between where Palestinian population centers are, including the small villages, and their land, uh, and obviously to enclose as much as possible of the Israeli colonist population in the West Bank on the western, uh, the western side of the wall. Um, but in so doing, of course, it's basically rendered life for tens of thousands of Palestinians completely and utterly and totally unlivable, because farmers who can't reach their farms to, to grow their crops can't live. What is the way out for farmers who can't reach their land to grow their crops? There is no way out. I mean, there is no alternative. There is not, there's nothing for them to do. So tens of thousands of people now are increasingly destitute, are thrown out of work, are unable to support their families, and of course are under massive pressure to leave. Just go away, leave. You're not wanted here, basically. And of course, many of them do, because what are they supposed to do, after all? At the end of the day, they're not 
political ideologues, they're farmers, and they want to live. That's one snapshot. The next snapshot I want to offer you takes us to Jerusalem, to East Jerusalem in particular. And the story has to do with the Israeli Ministry of the Interior. The Ministry of the Interior, remember the Israelis claim that Jerusalem is their capital. So the Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem, which was occupied in 1967 and illegally annexed by the Israelis, are basically, the Israelis kind of absorb them, not because they particularly wanted another quarter million Palestinian in their population, but because they wanted Jerusalem, these guys sort of came to the land, what are you going to do? So the Israelis maintain two separate branches of the Ministry of the Interior in Jerusalem. One, which is the nice branch in West Jerusalem, to which Jewish residents of the city go, and the other one in East Jerusalem, to which Palestinian residents go. The ministry branch uh, in East Jerusalem is something out of some horrific combination of Orwell and Kafka. That is to say, if you go there, it, just in order to get into the building, you have to get there shortly after midnight and stand in line and you know, deal with people hassling you and, and hope you can get in and so forth and so on. Uh, in hot weather, there's nowhere to shelter in the queues outside. You can see people holding newspapers over their heads to shelter. In lines for hours and hours and hours and hours just to get into the door to start dealing with the Israeli authorities waiting for them in the Ministry of the Interior. So this story concerns a woman called Samira Ayan, who's a Palestinian who was born in Jerusalem, raised in Jerusalem, grew up in Jerusalem. And she's going to this branch of the Ministry of the Interior to renew her husband's permit to live with her. Her husband is also Palestinian, but unlike her, he's not from Jerusalem, he's a refugee from 1948, and he grew up in Jordan. Now, Samira and her husband and her, their kids have all been living in Jerusalem for a number of years. They've applied for family unification many, many years previously, but their case was still pending as it is for 100,000 Palestinian applicants for family unification up and down the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Because, as you can imagine, the Israelis don't make it easy for Palestinian families to reunify across the various lines that the Israelis themselves have drawn and are enforcing with various mechanisms. So, be, while their case for family unification is pending, Samira has to keep going every year, every couple of years, to renew her husband's permit to stay with her in Jerusalem. So this is one occasion when she was going to get to renew the same permit. She's told that there's good news, that there's no need to come back again to renew the permit because in two weeks they'll be given their, fi their uh, family unification. But she was told she needed to return with all the documents, going back a period of 10 years or so, showing where she had been and when in Jerusalem in order to establish a record of having lived in Jerusalem continuously. So she needed to show them tax records and rental contracts and utility bills and all that kind of thing, going back a number of years, which of course is daunting because it's not like she could just go online and sort of download all the stuff from at and or whatever. She has to actually get all the bits and pieces of paper, which, I mean, I don't know, maybe best feel about like keeping paper records, but it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do going back a number of years. In any case, she put together the bits and pieces of paper, went back, stood in the same line to the Ministry of the Interior, and this is what she says. I sat with a clerk in booth number one, he asked me for my identity card, a request they generally make. I gave him my identity card, of course, together with all the other documents he had requested. And then he gave me a piece of paper and said, you shouldn't be here. You should go back to where you were. You have two weeks to sell your furniture and leave. Not quite believing what she had heard, Samira burst into tears. She started to scream. She demanded to see the officer in charge. All right, the Israeli clerk told her and he took her on towards his superior's office. Samira was still crying. On the way there, they passed another clerk who said, why are you crying? They took my identity card, Samira explained. Well, apparently you shouldn't be here, the other clerk said. Still unable to hold back her tears, Samira finally met the officer in charge. Why are you crying, he asked. If you continue to act in this manner, we'll take all the money you receive from the National Insurance Institute for two years. So you should behave properly because if you don't, we should also take your oldest son the identity card. You have two weeks to settle your affairs and to go back where you came from. Now, where she came from is Jerusalem, of course. Right? So what, what does it mean for her to go back where she came from? What happened to Samira is that she fell foul of an Israeli regulation 
that demands the Palestinians who are residents of Jerusalem to prove when a okay, turning point like this for her has come up, that Jerusalem is and has always continuously been their center of life without any interruption. So a Palestinian who lived abroad for a few years, a Palestinian who went to university in England or whatever, that that Palestinian Jerusalem hasn't always continuously been their center of life. Therefore, according to Israeli regulations, they're no longer entitled to be residents of Jerusalem, even though they were born in the city. So she was stripped of her Jerusalem residency. She is not alone, like Hamad Jalud in the north of the West Bank, facing this kind of uh, situation. Over the past few years alone, going back to about 2004, around 8,000 Palestinians from East Jerusalem have been stripped of their residency and expelled from the city of their birth by the Israeli authorities. Over the same period, about 20,000 new Jewish colonists have been added to the colonies that Israel is constructing in the same place, East Jerusalem. So one population is being removed, one population is being augmented. It's as simple and crude as that. People talk about the Nakba of 1948 and the forced explosion of Palestinians from their homeland, and of course that happened, but the point is that the Nakba began, it did not end in 1948, it continues to this very day in these small acts that people face one at a time, or two or three or four at a time, families at a time. Partly this has to do with an official Israeli, uh, well, actually Jerusalem municipality recommendation that the population of the city be kept in a ratio of 72% Jews to 28% non-Jews. This goes back to city planning documents in, 19, in the 1970s, 1977, to be precise. So part of what they do to maintain this 72 to 28 percent ratio of Jews to non-Jews, and I, there is no other city on the Earth's surface, as far as I know, that seeks to maintain this kind of ratio between this kind of population and that kind of population, and uses these kinds of methods to keep the populations, you know, more or less on target. But among the things that the Israelis do is they revoke people's residency whenever possible to reduce the number of Palestinians like that. They don't have, or they don't allow any planning in Palestinian areas of Jerusalem. They deny Palestinian permits to build, which means, among other things, that there's a constant wave of home demolitions inside Jerusalem. In the past few years, Again, going back to about 2006 in this case, about 400 Palestinian homes in East Jerusalem have been demolished by the state or the municipality, rendering about 1,500 Palestinians, including about 800 children, homeless in their own city. And I think what you need to do in thinking about this is to contemplate what it means for a state to maintain the deliberate, premeditated destruction of family homes as a constant normal, routine policy. Israel is the only state on earth that demolishes family homes deliberately as a matter of routine, everyday policy. It's not an exceptional circumstance at all, either in East Jerusalem or in the West Bank, where much of Gaza off and on. These are people's houses. They're not just statistics. They're houses, they're homes where people used to live. And if you can imagine losing your home and what home means to you, I think you can appreciate the significance of these kinds of stories. However, the process of maintaining this balance of ethnicities in Jerusalem, uh, on the, at the, you know, either at the hands of the municipality or the Ministry of the Interior, are both working together, begins at birth, not just like, afterwards when people have houses. A Jewish baby born in Jerusalem, for example, is automatically granted a birth certificate and a state identity number, which is basically like a social security number in the U.S. It's a number you need to have for your life, for, for, you know, to do anything official in your life. A Palestinian baby born in the same city is not treated the same way. If one parent, the, if one of the baby's parents is from East Jerusalem and the other is not, the parents will be given a notification of live birth. And they can use that to apply for the same birth certificate that a Jewish baby is given at the moment, of, you know, shortly after the moment of birth, it's a matter of automatic policy. But that document also doesn't give the child a state ID number. So for that, the parents have to apply a third time, or sorry, a second time, a third document for the state ID number. Any time that they apply for one of these secondary or tertiary documents, they may be asked to prove 
something that nobody Jewish anywhere in the world has ever has to prove, which is that Jerusalem has, is and has always been continuously the center of life, and it's not. They run the risk not only of not getting the document they're after, but of being stripped of residency and expelled from Jerusalem itself. Again, I want to reiterate that nobody Jewish from anywhere in the world is ever asked to substantiate anything like this, even if they have nothing to do with Jerusalem but have come there recently. Whereas Palestinians who were born in Jerusalem, and I'm not talking about 1943 or 1940 or 1946, I'm talking about now, are continuously stripped of the residency, the right to live in the city of their birth. Again, to make this point, this is ethnic cleansing. It's not something that's happening in the deep, dark, misty past of history. It's happening right now, today, literally. One last pair of data points from Jerusalem. Uh, two archaeological projects, or you know, construction projects going on on either side of the old city. On the west side of the old city, some of you, since you're in LA, may have heard of the, the Simon Wiesenthal Center to construct what he calls a Museum of Tolerance, a branch of the one here on Pico Boulevard. But on top of uh, the oldest and most important Muslim cemetery of all of Jerusalem, after all of Palestine. So if you can imagine what it means to construct something calling itself, daring to call itself, a museum of tolerance on the ruins of a graveyard, but in all seriousness, congratulating itself about how tolerant it is, uh, it's an extraordinary thing. The, but the, what's even more extraordinary is if you put it in the context of what's going on elsewhere in the city and think that on the other side of the old city of Jerusalem, there's an area called Sidwen, a Palestinian neighborhood, that is now facing the prospect of mass demolition in order to clear space for an archaeological park called the City of David, which is where the archaeologists claim contains the ruins of some ancient ruin from two or three thousand years ago. They, they actually they have no archaeological evidence whatsoever to prove this, but they claim that it's there. And so their aim is to demolish uh, hundreds of, well, dozens of Palestinian houses to clear space to make this park. So, on one side of Jerusalem, if you want, bodies are being removed to make room for living people, that is, visitors to a museum of tolerance. And on the other side of Jerusalem, living people are being removed to make room for the excavation, supposedly, of bodies. Uh, but, of course, in either case, the bodies being removed are Palestinian or Arab, and the bodies that are being, you know, commemorated or preserved are Jewish, and that's part of what's going on in Jerusalem. Third snapshot I want to show you is a village called Ein Haut, about which, in my colleague Susan Hundovich, of course, we have one of the world authorities, um, so she can say much more about this than I can, but I'll say a few things about it. Ein Haut is a 700-year-old Palestinian village in the north of what's now Israel. Its residents in 1948, like villages up and down Palestine, were expelled by Zionist forces. But unlike many of their compatriots, many of the people from this village stayed behind. I mean, not in the village, but in, you know, within the state. They didn't leave the borders of the state. So they're classified as what the state of Israel calls present absentees, which is a remarkably oxymoronic term. This designed to designate a Palestinian uh, absentee that is somebody that the state says we would take your property back if you weren't there. Uh, but they're present as in they're within the borders of the state. Um, about 25% of the Palestinian population who are citizens of the state are present absentees. It's an extraordinary number. Anyway, the, in this particular case, the people of the village after the expulsion of 1948 sort of camped outside in the outskirts of what had been the orchards and fields of the village, and they kept trying to get back to their homes over a period of years. The village was empty. It wasn't damaged. There was no fighting there. They were just thrown out. So the village was quite intact. And they, tried, they kept trying to get back to their homes, but of course they were barred from doing so by the Israeli army. Mostly, he recalls Muhammad Abu Heja, who lives there, mostly there were unofficial attempts to talk to this or that Jewish official to get permission to return, but they all failed. Before the present absentee law, he continued, which is 1950, there were also a few failed attempts by villagers to move back into their vacant houses without permission. Even after 1951, there was one attempt by a cousin of my grandfather, he says, who now lives in Tamra. He tried to enter his home in Ein Haut, but the police came and threw him in jail. After that, no one tried. So if you can imagine people who are living in the orchard of their village, and their village is right there, but empty, and they're not allowed to move back in. If you can imagine what that is like. And these are people who are supposed to be citizens of the state that's done this to them. In the 1950s, because it was a pretty village and it was uninhabited, because the 
people were forced out and never allowed back in. A number of Israeli artists, including those connected to the Dada movement, said, you know, this is actually a very pretty village. Why don't we create an artist's colony here? So they did. So they created an artist colony called Ein Holland in Hebrew. And, you know, the sort of uh, sculpture gardens and, you know, uh, pretty cafes and what. In fact, the town's mosque has been turned into a cafe, Cafe Voltaire, I think it is. Uh, no, sorry, Cafe Rosa, uh, named after Rosa Luxemburg, I think. Um, but the, you can see that the houses are all the, the original Palestinian houses that are now have been put to a new use with their residents still listening to the music coming from their own town square, but they can't get to their town because they're not allowed to, because they don't fit the state's criteria for the population that the state has in mind, obviously. Eventually, the people living in the orchards started putting up you know, shacks and lean-tos and so forth, and they made a new town called Ein Haud Jadida, or New Ein Haud, which you know, for them was a sort of temporary affair until they could finally go back to their real houses. This town is one of what's called an un, uh, the unrecognized villages within Israel. And, but let me just explain it for a couple of minutes. It's worth pausing on. Unrecognized villages are villages uh, lived in by Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel whose existence, that is the village's existence, the state does not recognize. So in, 19, in the 1960s, when the Israelis were drawing up the first planning documents of charting and zoning land, and this is agricultural, this is residential, etc., etc., they, they included about 100 or so Palestinian towns and villages, the bigger ones, Nazareth and so forth, inside, in, in their planning documents. But about 150 or so smaller towns and villages they didn't include. Which means that if you look at official state documents, zoning documents and planning documents, so forth, maps, etc., these villages don't show up. They don't officially exist. Even though almost all of them predate the state, many of them go back hundreds of years. So because they don't exist officially, they're not connected to you know, sewerage or road networks or electricity grids or phone networks and schools and uh, all the rest of it. So, about 10% of Israel's Palestinian citizens live in unrecognized villages. I know that Jadida is one of them. What makes it exceptional is that it's, it was built after 48, since, as I said, it's put together in you know, the form of lean tos and shacks by refugees who were not allowed to go back to their village, which was still perfectly habitable at that point. Reflecting on what it means for a village not to be recognized, Muhammad, this guy who's living in Anhaud Jadida, reflects, uh, sorry, muses, quote, it means that your village doesn't get any services at all. No electricity, no running water, no schools, no medical clinics. There are no planned or paved roads to the area where you live. There are no telephones, obviously some people have cell phones. It means you're cut off from the rest of the world. Not just the larger outside world, but even from Israel, what goes on there. The isolation is total except for communication with the government, which are conducted, communications with the government, which are conducted through the courts or via the police. When it comes to harassing us, we exist and are in communication with various offices of the state administration. But when it comes to giving us anything at all that could make us feel that we are in some way part of the state, we are forgotten. Asked if the villagers have any contact with the Israeli artists who live in their homes less than a mile away, Muhammad reflects, and I quote him again. About ten years ago, he says, I said in a newspaper interview that even though our present struggle is about our new village and being given rights there, this does not prevent us from dreaming about our old homes. The Jewish inhabitants of Ein Hod were up in arms about this and said that they would not help us anymore. But when have they ever helped us? In fact, he continues, the people who live in our homes and on our land, in the original Ein Hod, do not like to hear about us because they don't want to be reminded of what happened. A person who's living in your house against your will and who knows whose house he's living in, what kind of feelings must that person have? especially if he's an artist. Now, in the case of Ein Haud Jadida, the, the new town that put, put together from lean tos and shacks and so forth, the Israeli government has tried not only to make it go away, but actually to, to blot it out of existence by uh, landscaping it. This is something that the Jewish National Fund and its forestation project, of which it endlessly congratulates itself. If you go to the Jewish National Fund website, the first thing you see is plant trees in Israel. And I'm sure you've all heard about turning is with making the desert green and all this stuff. So the Jewish National Fund, it's one of National Fund, it's one of its main projects is to plant forests all over, or wherever it can, essentially. Usually, usually trees that grow very fast, cypresses, for example, 
uh, and that are not necessarily indigenous to the, to the land at all. The reason why they do this is, for one thing, uh, to, to fill up gaps where you might otherwise see the ruins of the hundreds of Palestinian villages that were depopulated in 1948. So the JNF plants forests on top of the ruins of the villages to make the villages go away, or the ruins of the villages go away as quickly as possible. But in the case of Ayyad al-Jadida, by planting these tall cypress trees all around the, the, the village with its small olive trees and pomegranate trees and so forth, what happened was the cypresses quickly blotted out the sun. The olive trees stopped fruiting, and pomegranate trees died because they need sun, and they were being uh, cut off from the sun. Muhammad continues, after I began to understand what was going on in this country, I began to feel like I know who I am. I am a native of this land, and this is actually my country. The stranger is one who came from outside and refuses to recognize me. I live in my own country. My people and my ancestors are buried here. I belong to this land. I do feel like a stranger among them, and they feel like I'm not of their world. But I'm not a stranger to this soil. But here, I think, is where we can see the Jewish National Fund and the project that it represents, trying to plant forests everywhere. And in fact, if you read its account of what happened in 1948, it's kind of stunning. It's on the JNF website. You can see it for yourselves afterwards. But basically, there's no mention whatsoever of the expulsion and uprooting of Palestinians. There's no mention at all of Palestinian inhabitants of what happened in Palestine until 1948. There's this miraculous birth of the state, and then basically the story goes on from there, and the other side isn't, isn't discussed. So the, the JNF forestation project, I think, needs to be seen as explicitly part of a project of ethnic cleansing, only in this case, covering up the ruins and traces and signs and markers and memorials of ethnic cleansing through building, uh, through, through planting forests. Interestingly, in the major fire in one of the JNF forests a couple of years ago near Haifa, one reason why the trees burn so quickly is that they're not indigenous trees. They don't really belong in the land. And I think that's a very interesting sort of symbolic you know, uh, thing to think about. The next uh, snapshot I want to give you is the village of Arapib in the south of the country. And both here and in the case of Ein Haud, I want to reiterate that I'm talking about Palestinians who are citizens of the state of Israel. And if you know anything about Israel, you know that it congratulates itself endlessly as to its supporters and admirers in this country, of treating all of its citizens equally because it is, as they put it, a Jewish and democratic state. So I think you can tell from the citizens of Ein, from the residents of Ein Haud that they're not exactly treated the same as their Jewish fellow citizens of the state. And what's going on in the south of the country, in the town of Arapib, among other places, makes that point, I think, even more forcefully. Arapib is another of these unrecognized villages, which I've already told you about. Only in this case, it's populated, as, it, as are most of the un, unrec unrecognized villages, by Bedouin Palestinians in the, in the desert, in the Nakba Desert in the south of the country. Um, in the, on the 27th of July, 2010, the Israelis said this village, Arapib, is illegal. This, zone, this land is zoned uh, residential, uh, sorry, agricultural, and in fact, the JNF wants to plant a forest here. So you basically have to go. So they came and demolished the village. They, they blasted away all the town's houses, its school, its mosque, and they uprooted 4,500 olive trees and, and basically wheat and barley fields and so forth in order for the JNF to come in and plant uh, trees in the desert to say that we're, you know, we're making the desert turn green and all this stuff. Uh, the, the move was, was quite violent. And again, what I want to reiterate is that this is the state dealing with its own citizens, the ones that it always says how equally it treats them. The most remarkable thing about the story of Arapib, though, is that after the Israelis demolished it in July 2010, the villagers rebuilt it. They said, you know what, we're tough, we're, we're, we're going to stay on our land. We are, you know, we're citizens, we're staying here, it doesn't matter what you say. So we're rebuilding our village. So they rebuilt their village. And then the Israelis came back and they re-demolished it. And then the villagers said, you know what, we don't care, we're going to build it again. So they rebuilt it, and the Israelis came back and re-demolished it. And they rebuilt it again, and the Israelis came back and re-demolished it. 
and they built it again, and the Israelis came back and we demolished it. And I can repeat that because until December last year, the Israelis demolished the village of Al Aqib since July 2010 33 times. 33 times it's been demolished, 33 times it's been rebuilt, and the Israelis come back and demolish it all over again. And again, I want to reiterate that these are citizens of the state that are being treated like this. Why are they being treated like this? Because they are inconveniently cluttering up land that the Jewish National Fund wants to build a forest on. Because there's a vision of what the Jewish desert should look like, and these people are in the way. And that's what it amounts to. There are official plans that have been drawn up by the Israeli government, which you can check out for yourselves, to move 30,000 Bedouin Palestinians in the south of the country, the desert, to what the Israeli government officially calls, with no sense of irony as far as I can tell, concentration points, in order to open up expanses of desert to this other kind of vision that they have in mind, of which these people sort of inconveniently get in the way. Oops, sorry. This is the last demo. This is one of the demos. I don't know which one it is. While I run, let me just continue and ask you to reflect on what it means for a state to treat its citizens in this particular way. And of course, not all citizens are treated like this. Certain citizens are treated like this. The ones who don't happen to be Jewish. This is important because, well actually because of several things. One, because of the whole question of the two-state solution, which I'll get to in a couple of minutes by way of conclusion. Um, but also in order for us to reflect on what possible future there might, there might be, in a state that so explicitly treats citizens who don't fit its own vision of itself as it deems they should, uh, and treats, treats them like this, and worse than this, in fact. In fact, it's not just this kind of thing. If you look at, systematically, if you look at all of the major laws that codified the South African experience of apartheid in the 1930s, well, 1940s, on, 50s and on, the 60s and 70s, and look at all the major laws. For every single one of them, there's an equivalent inside Israel. And I'm talking about Israel within its pre-67 borders, never mind the occupied territories. It's there too, much more visibly perhaps, but inside Israel as well. So for example, South Africa's notorious Population Registration Act, which assigned to every citizen of the state a racial identity and then said, that on the basis of the racial identity, you, know, you have to live here and you live here and you live here and so forth. Israel treats its citizens in exactly the same way, in the sense that it classifies them according to nationality. 
So even though it can give Palestinian citizens of the state citizenship, grudgingly, it gives them citizenship, it doesn't recognize them as being what the state calls Jewish nationals. And the way the laws work in Israel is to privilege nationality over citizenship, which is to say certain rights depend not on citizenship, but on nationality, national affiliation. What that means ultimately is that in making this distinction between citizenship and nationality, somebody who's Jewish but not an Israeli citizen actually has rights that trump those of a citizen who's not Jewish, because nationality is the key, is the key determining category. According to the High Court of Israel in the ruling 1970s, there is no such thing, and I'm quoting them, there is no such thing as an Israeli nation separate from the Jewish people. And of course, what that does is it puts people who are citizens of the state but who are not Jewish in a very awkward situation. Well, then what happens to us? 20% of the population of the state and rising. What future is, for, is there for us in this state that, that says we are excluded from the nation because we don't fit this particular uh, ethnic and religious uh, identification? So that's a direct correspondence with what's up with South African practice of apartheid. The Group Areas Act in South Africa, which assigned, according to racial identity, people, you know, some blacks have to live here and colors live here and whites live here and so forth, uh, has again a direct correspondence inside Israel because where you get to live depends on the na your national identity and the way which is adjudicated by either formally or informally by the state or by uh, state sanctioned civil society. So what that means is is a total segregation in terms of where Jews and non-Jews live inside the state, exactly analogous to the situation in, uh, in, in South African apartheid following the Group Areas Act in 1950. Um, the South African Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act 1949, which prevented interracial marriage, has again a direct equivalent inside Israel in the sense that somebody who's Jewish cannot legally marry somebody who's not Jewish inside the state. It cannot be done. The state doesn't allow it, period. Which of course means that the whole idea of trying to break down borders through love and romance like Romeo and Juliet doesn't work inside Israel because the state doesn't let it happen. Exactly analogously to the situation inside South Africa and apartheid. Here yeah, I'm talking about the state and the citizens within the state within its 367 borders. Never mind the West Bank, although there's another analogy here. The Bantu Authorities Act 1951 in South Africa has a direct equivalent in the way in which the Israelis tried to create the so-called Palestinian Authority to basically Say that's where Palestinians can look for their own sense of national identification and so forth. But what this means is that up and down Israel, systematically, from birth to death, there are legal, juridical, institutional dif differentiations and distinctions between Jews and non-Jews. And systematically, Jews are privileged over non-Jews, legally speaking. It's in France, it's just in, in, in the way the laws work. Um, there are three dozen separate major laws that explicitly privilege Jews over non-Jews. One quick and obvious example, the law of return is, a national, is Israel's nationality law and it applies only to Jews. Non-Jews need not apply, period. That's how the law works. And that's how the state identifies its citizens, legally and on paper. Some numbers, I think, bear out this sense of discrimination that's not just you know, because sometimes the of Israel, if you raise this point, they say, ah, you know, all, everybody states has its problems, and there are these things, and it'll be worked out. This is written into the law. It's institutional, it's hard, not just unfortunate. But some numbers, anyway, bear this out. There are 1,600 daycare centers in Israel, of which 25 are in Palestinian towns. These are all state run centers, of course, right? They're designed for the state, which has a kind of socialist element to it to, to provide for its citizens. There are 80,000 Israeli children in daycare, which, if the numbers are proportionate, about 20,000 of them ought to be, more or less, ought to be Palestinian citizens. In fact, of the number of children in state-subsidized, state-sanctioned, state-supported daycare systems, only 4,000 or so are Palestinian because of the lack of uh, uh, infrastructure. The ratio of education spending by the state on Jewish, as compared to non-Jewish, uh, citizens I'm talking about here, not people in the West Bank, citizens of the state, is in fact on an order of three to one. The state spends three times as much educating Jewish citizens as it does non-Jewish citizens. This is up to today. I'm not talking about the 1950s, I'm talking about right now. If you look at the number of towns in Israel granted top priority by the state for education, remember it's all state planned. There's 553 towns in the state's list of 
areas designed for top priority for education, of which four are Palestinian. If you look at the number of art schools made available to Jewish students in Israel, this is you know, K through 12, zero are available to non-Jewish students, all of which are provided by the state. If you look at the number of applicants to university who are Jewish or rejected from university, it's about 16%, whereas the number of Palestinians who are rejected is 45%. These are citizens of the state, and mind you, Palestinians place a very, very, very high premium on their children's education, famously, across the Arab world. If you look at the number of percentage of Israeli citizens who are Palestinians, 20%, as we said before, but only about 10% of Israeli undergraduates are Palestinian, which is not at all in keeping with the, with the, with the population ratio. Only about 3% of the graduate students are Palestinian, and only about 1% of Israeli faculty are Palestinian. None of these numbers make any sense in terms of population, and certainly not in terms of the Palestinian emphasis on education and learning and so forth. My last snapshot, because you're getting tired, and I am too, actually, <laughs> is Gaza. Uh, and there's a lot to be said about Gaza, but actually I don't want to talk about bombing and deprivation and people growing up in abysmal circumstances and children's growth being stunted, all of which we could talk about. I want to talk instead about something much more banal. And actually I think in its very banality is actually much more, uh, in a sense, palpable for some strange alchemical reason. As you probably know, 80% of the population of the Gaza Strip are refugees. They don't belong in the Gaza Strip. They were driven out of the rest of southwestern Palestine during the 1948 ethnic cleansing of the country. In fact, the southwest of what's now Israel is the most thoroughly ethnically cleansed part of the entire country. Like the north, Galilee, they didn't do a very good job of expelling people. So there's a big Palestinian, a relatively big Palestinian population in the north of Israel. The south of Israel was basically freed of Arabs, essentially. Not one single village of all the dozens and dozens and dozens of villages in the southwest of the country still remain. They were all bulldozed, demolished, cleared away. It is, in the words of the Israeli journalist Gideon Levy, and I'm quoting him here, the most Arab-free area in Israel. It was the scene of total ethnic cleansing, Levy says, which left not a vestige apart from the heaps of ruins and the prickly pear bushes. It was all erased from the surface of the earth, yet. Only the skeletons of a few beautiful homes would somehow still stand, and the piles of stones, the orchards and natural fences made of sabra bushes, remain as mute testimony among the eucalyptus groves, the new settlements, and the orchards that were planted on the sites of the destruction by the Jaina, among other people. From the Ashkelon Road, it is possible to see a few of the ruins. This is still uh, Levy speaking. But who pays attention? Who asks himself what these houses are, what used to be here, where the former residents are? as he shoots past on the highway. He then described a trip across the rolling hills. Quoting him again, we drove like detectives across the dunes, between the natural brush, the fruit groves, the garbage dumps, and the local communities, hunting for any sign of earlier life. In one orchard we found an old faucet, in another the remnants of a millstone. He encounters the local school director, the Israeli Yair Farjoun, who was very knowledgeable about what happened there in 1948. And Farjoun tells Levi, and I'm quoting him here, in terms of, this is Farjoun, not Levi, in terms of the Zionist ethos, the best work of 1948 was done in the South. If not for that work, Ahmad and Mustafa would be holding a discussion about us, and I prefer me holding a discussion about Ahmad and Mustafa. He continues, this is Farjoun, although Levi's quoting him, anyone who tells you that there was not ethnic cleansing here will be lying. And anyone who tells you that without the ethnic cleansing, Israel would have been established will also be lying." Unquote. So what's fascinating about it is, of course, if you look at a map of the southwest of Israel, and this is a sort of a map that's just a very small area, actually, the, the dotted line to the west of this map, the red dotted line, is the very edge of the Gaza Strip. And if you zoom in a little bit, um, you probably can't see them from where you're seated, seated, but if you look at the red dots, of which there are a cluster. Those are ruins of Palestinian villages that were wiped, that, you know, the people were expelled into Gaza, that's where they, that's where they ended up, and they walked to Gaza, and the villages were, were, were obliterated. Um, you can probably see from the map, too, that most of the villages, in fact, as is the case up and down the length of Israel, about 93% of the villages that were destroyed, or depopulated and then demolished in 1948, remain uninhabited, they're, just still, they're still open, 
either open or they're being forested by the JNF, then nobody's living there. Um, but the ruins of these villages, like Deir Sunaid in the top left of the map, Simpson, oh, oh, just in this little map here, this is a very small area, as you can tell. Um, they're still there, and the, the amazing thing is that the people who used to live there are now in Gaza. So literally, from where they are in Gaza, they can see the land that they used to live on. I mean, it's literally right there. It's like a 10 minute walk, 15 minute walk, 20 minute walk, half hour walk. It's very, very, very close. So the astonishing thing about the Gaza Strip and about the people who are there is that if the Israelis opened the gates of Gaza and said, you can go home, these people would literally be able to walk back home to, the, to their, where their homes had been. That's how easy it is. That's how close it is. I think the question you have to ask yourself is, well, why can't they just walk back home? And I think you know the answer to that question. They can't walk back home because they don't belong in the state. They don't belong in the state because they are not Jewish. It is as simple as that. So what are we to conclude from all of this? I think if you look at what I'm, what I'm talking about, and, and I want you to notice that I'm talking about Palestinians living under occupation, I'm talking about Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel, I'm talking about Palestinian refugees, and all the major groups of Palestinian people. It's, it should be clear that what they are going through, each in their different ways, Samira Anyan trying to get her family unification papers in East Jerusalem, Hamad Jalou trying to get to his cucumber farm in the north of the West Bank, some guy, some old man who wants to get back to his village, and he can see through the cracks of his prison, but he can't walk there, even though it's a five or ten minute walk. He's not allowed to go back home. They're all experiencing versions of the same thing. What they're experiencing, what all Palestinians experience, is this interlocking network of legal, administrative, physical, material, infrastructural, and other mechanisms that are designed to keep the state with one identity in a land that has always historically had many identities. If you're trying to impose a state with one identity on a land that has many identities, and the many identities are still there, it takes an awful amount of work, I mean awful in both senses of the word, to do that. It's not easy to do it. It takes a lot of work to be able to say, you know, we want, this is a Jewish state, we're going to maintain its Jewish character, and this is what it takes. This is what it takes. So I know that Israel's American supporters in particular, particularly the liberal J Street types, like to pride themselves on how on their liberal values and all the rest of it. But here we're up against historical material circumstances and facts that I could elaborate all, all night, but it would bore you to hear someone that do it. Which is the very existence the maintenance, the creation, the ongoing maintenance of this kind of state that insists pathologically almost on one identity at the exclusion and the cost of all the other identities that get in the way in all these different kinds of ways. In order for that state to exist, this is what it must do. There is no escaping that fact. It has to drive people off their land. It has to make them live in inhuman circumstances where a guy can't get his own tomato patch, or where an old man can't walk to his village, or where a woman can't live with her husband, or where a child can't see his father. That's what it has to do. There is no other way around it. That's what maintaining an ethnocratic state in a historically heterogeneous, culturally diverse, religiously diverse land requires. There is no way around it. What that means is, if you support this kind of state, you can deny it all you want, but you better look into your heart and admit that that's what you support. You have to support it, if that's the kind of state you support. It's, it's just, there's, it's just like, not rocket science, it's really basic. Where does that leave us then? Is there no alternative to this you know, sort of nightmarish vision? I think there is, and I think that the discourse of two states is not going to, it, it can't possibly solve these, these problems. There's no way to do it. Really. I mean, it's just, it can't be done. First of all, first of all, because the only
territory that is, has even remotely been talked about as the basis of the Palestinian state, which is some version of the West Bank, is at this point, this is the most recent UN map of the West Bank. The, the white areas are areas where Palestinians are allowed to, to live, quote unquote, freely, although each area is blocked out from the other areas, and there's the wall and the checkpoints and the roadblocks and all this. The blue areas are areas that are inaccessible to Palestinians. Um, what, in fact, where we are now, as this map shows, is about 40% of the West Bank is, cut, is off limits to Palestinians. It's taken up either by Israeli colonies or by Israeli infrastructure or by Israeli closed military areas and seam zones and all the rest of it. Uh, the rest of it, the 60% the that remains, is broken up into little bits and pieces, like a kind of archipelago. The idea that this could be turned into a state, never mind that it would have no control over its borders or its airspace, never mind that its aquifer is actually in the western part of the territory, which is the part that Israel is claiming with its wall. Never mind all those kinds of details. Never mind that there are almost 600,000 Jewish colonists living in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, a number that has tripled since negotiations began about this two-state solution 20 years ago. Never mind all that stuff. Even if a state were created in this land, even if you could put aside the question of water, the single most important natural resource in this part of the world, even if you could put aside the, the colonists and what to do with them, in fact, even if you say in, in some wild imaginary vision, let's, we can just do it as a thought experiment. Let's pretend the Israelis say, okay, you know what, you're right, we should have a two-state solution. There's, there's, there's no other way. So, let's imagine the Israelis dismantle all of their colonies in occupied land and remove 600,000 Jewish colonists, which is very, very hard to imagine. Just for the sake of argument, let's imagine it. Let's imagine that they say Palestinians can really have like an actual real state with their own currency, their own borders, their own airspace, their own ability to enter into negotiations and, and treaties and stuff with other states. All this is totally unimaginable, but let's imagine it. Let's imagine that the state actually has control over its airspace, its eastern border with Jordan, its water resources. Let's say these really say, no, the, aqua, the water aqua, no, you, you have the water aqua, it's okay, you can have it. Let's just indulge ourselves in this fantasy. <laughs> Let's say these really say, you know, East Jerusalem 67, you know, you're right, we shouldn't have annexed it. Okay, you can have it back. You can have it as your capital. No, really, to have it. Let's just go all the way, seriously. And so a Palestinian state is created there. None of this is even remotely thinkable, as, you, as I'm sure you're aware by now. But even if it was, thinkable. Would that end the question of Palestine once and for all? Only about 40% of the population of Palestinians in the world lives in the occupied territory. 60% do not. In any version of the two-state solution that anybody's ever talked about, there is no room for the vast majority of Palestinians. They just don't fit in the paradigm. They don't fit. We're talking about millions of people. Who, who are basically told, who, I don't know, I'm not even sure what they're told. They're basically told, you, you go away, you don't fit the pattern, I don't want to see you because you don't, we don't know what to do with you, basically. Millions of people. Do you think those people are just going to disappear, go away, negate themselves? That's not going to happen. People don't do that. Nobody in the world has ever done that. It's not going to happen to these people either. They're still going to be there. Even if the refugees were miraculously you know, there's some plan that we finally, Earth is, you know, it's, uh, its last vestiges, its last days are here, we need to settle some Jupiter or Mars, Jupiter can't be settled, but Mars, let's say. <laughs> and, okay, we need, you know, we need five million people, let's move all thousand refugees to Mars. So that's, the refugees are out of the question, and the, the West Bank people have to stay. And Gaza, there's this incredible tunnel that links the West Bank to Gaza, and East Jerusalem, and all this stuff. What about the Palestinian citizens of the State of Israel? who are 20% of the population of the state. What happens to them in this two-state solution? You already know, as I've been telling you, their rights already are severely abrogated. They are not institutionally, legally, politically, or otherwise considered equal citizens of the state. They cannot be. They are not members of the nation that the state claims to represent, the Jewish nation, as the state puts it. There is no room for them in the state's vision of itself. If a two-state solution were enacted, the Palestinian citizens of the State of Israel would, even, would be in an even worse situation than they are now. 
much worse situation. If I could be liable to be external. In other words, there is no way for the two-state solution to address and finally bring a just peace to the question of Palestine. It cannot be done. There is no way for it to be, to be done. So, should we end the evening with gloom and doom? I don't want to, I'm not a big fan of gloom and doom. And in this very room, at this very podium, I've taught poetry that is meant to lift the soul, including poems by Blake and Shelley, Keats, and so forth. And I don't have any of those poems to mind, although I talked to Keats earlier today, but I do have a sense in mind that this can't be where the story ends. It's not possible for us to go on accepting this reality, which is an apartheid reality. We have to end this situation. And there is an alternative. And the alternative is to say, look, the project to impose a state with a monochromatic single identity on a land that has many identities cannot be done without constant, endless, ongoing, perpetual violence. And we don't want to accept that violence. That violence has to stop. So, that state project has to stop. What's the alternative? To create a state that treats all of its citizens equally. In which you're Jewish, you're Muslim, you're Christian, whatever you want to be. If you don't want to be anything, that's fine too. You could just be a citizen of the state, and the state will treat all of its citizens equally, and there won't be anybody superman and un unsuperman. There won't be those kinds of differentiations. There will be legal equality for all. Now, uh, you know, according to supporters of Israel, if you start saying, we believe in a state that treats all of its citizens equally, that's what they call delegitimization of Israel. And, you know, what I have to ask you is, well, I mean, I really don't understand. How can calling for equality be delegitimization? I just, it, honestly, I don't understand it. I really don't understand what that means. If equality and justice are delegitimizing something, well, what is it that they're delegitimizing? And I think you have to ask yourself that question. What's, what's so legitimate about an order that says inequality and injustice are the order of the day. But that's what our choice is. We can accept justice and equality, or we can accept injustice and inequality. And how you choose is up to you, but I know what my choice is. Thank you. So we'll have about 15 or 20 minutes for a Q&A for anybody if you have questions. Um, you can just raise your hand and then Professor Mekhi can take from there. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that, that I sort of admire about the BDS movement uh, is that it conceptualizes Palestinian self-determination and liberation outside of the framework of statecraft. Uh, what uh, what kind of alternative models to even the one state solution could you possibly sort of like city states or something or some kind of discussion like that? Could you I, I, like could you would you be willing to entertain? It does it have to be about building a state or is a state in and of itself in some ways possibly a repressive apparatus? Given that what we've seen from the PA and what we've seen from Hamas and what we've seen come out of the sort of political elite. Ah, that's an excellent question. And you know, there are serious in all seriousness, there are past things to talk about the no state solution too. Which, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for no states as well. But we have to remember all this stuff about states, we, we really have to take very seriously the idea that the state form as we've inherited it is a very recent construction. I mean Europeans came up with the modern state form for their purposes in the nineteenth century because it fit what they wanted to do. And the rest of us have just been sort of foisted on us, and we're told we have to have states too. And then, as you're saying, maybe we should think about other forms of organization, political organization, social organization within the state. I mean, that's a, obviously a topic for much further discussion we can't get into right now, but I think it, it's definitely worth thinking about, or at least asking back those kinds of questions. There's no, no question about that. Um, the other thing I would say that's, that's also very important is that it's worth thinking about. Um, 
ways of, th uh, of uh, theorizing or understanding or conceiving of national identity or even communal identity in ways that also don't have to do with the state. The, the line has been so far that insofar as you have a national identity, you have to have a state, right? So that every, every state has a nation corresponding to a kind of equivalent between state and nation. And that's obviously what Israel is trying to do, being the, as it claims, the, the state of the Jewish nation. Um, and I, don't, I also don't think that that's necessarily true, because there are other ways of organizing yourself. There are other forms of self-determination. There are other forms of collective expression, of identity, that don't involve state forms. So I think the idea of a state and the limits of the state, I think we should, those questions should be thought through very seriously. And I think we really should look beyond the state and ask, you know, really think about the history of the state, the state form, where it came from, who it served, who it doesn't serve, and think about other ways of doing it. But even if there is a state, even if a one-state solution is adopted, as I hope it will be, it would, it would clearly be a very unusual state, because it would explicitly be a state that's not for, tied to a nation. Which, even, even if that's all it is, is already, I think, a worthwhile experiment. But how can you have a state that says, you know, we're not going to have a nation, we're just we're a state that's going to make sure that rights are attended to, and that social services are administered, that schools are here, this kind of thing, rather than having a kind of nationalist agenda. So, which, again, you know, enough nationalism. It's, 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 nationalism is also running its course. I think it's been clear since the middle of the 20th century, at least. But, but thanks for the question. No, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, let's put it this way. Insofar as, there's, insofar as we, there might be something calling itself a two-state solution, which I think is a remote possibility, but it is theoretically possible that there be something dressed up as a two-state solution. In other words, I think it's conceivable that a, something calling itself or being called a Palestinian state might be created uh, in the West Bank, because you know, they, there has been talk about that. Um, I think it would be I think it would be a trap for Palestinians to accept that state. I think it was a trap that the Palestinians put themselves in in going to the UN to seek recognition of the statehood in, in West Bank, for example, in the occupied territories. Um, and the reason I think that is because, among other things, if uh, something calling it the Palestinian state is created to the, a lot of the world, it'll be it'll be it'll seem that well that's it it's a state now. So the, the, problem is over. And of course the problem won't be over. That's that's one major issue. The second thing is that it would leave Palestinian refugees, a single biggest group of Palestinians, completely out, you know, in the dark and, and left to their own devices essentially. And their right of return, which is which is the key thing in the entire question of Palestine. And it would leave of course the Palestinian citizens of Israel in a much, much, much worse situation than they already are now, which is a very bad situation. So I don't think, you know, I think we should no longer waste time trying to imagine a two-state solution, whether it's an ideal one or a, an unideal one. I think we should really focus our energy and time to either count those questions like the ones we've asked before about well, what alternatives are there to the state form itself, or perhaps somewhat more practically saying there should be a single democratic and secular state that treats all of its citizens equally. And that's it. It would be a state like many other states in that sense, in a sort of formal sense even though it'll be a state with not just one national identity, but a more complex sense of cultural and national you know, and political identity internally. But I mean, I think the idea of a two-state is, is it's over and it's dead. It has been dead for a long time. You That's a very, very important question. Thank you for the question. 
Um, I think Palestinians, I think if you look at the history of the Palestinian struggle, it's over the 60, so, 60 or so years of the, of the struggle, it's the center of gravity of the struggle is alternate between being inside and being outside. Sometimes the energy has been on the outside, the refugees, people on the outside, the PLO when it was outside and so forth. Sometimes, as in the, the first thing they it was more on the inside. So there's been a kind of coming and going. I think that it's true that people living under occupation are in desperate, desperate circumstances. It's just eking out an existence for now is exhausting as it is, never mind engaging political action, although they do, as, you, as you're saying, up and down the length of the wall, for example. There are always protests, uh, non-violent protests, up and down the length of the wall, all the time. However, I think part of what we're seeing is a further mobilization of Palestinian refugees, Palestinian in exile. I think we're seeing, for example, there were inklings of this last year, I think it would be more again this year, mass mo uh, mobilizations on the borders of Israel, with tens of thousands of people that happened last, last May. I think there'll be more of that again, you know, sort of manifesting within, in a view of the Arab Spring, what happened, what's been happening, what is happening across the Arab world, the sense of mass mobilization. I think those things are all possible from the outside as well as from the inside. But there are two or three other really important pieces to this puzzle. One is that Palestinians inside Israel, Palestinian citizens of the state, are actually much, much, much more vocal and active now than they have ever been in the past. A new generation is completely fearless in taking on Israeli power and hegemony inside the state, and is very, very vocal in advocating for Palestinian rights within the state as well as linking to Palestinian, to, to the broader Palestinian struggle. And finally, and I think probably in some sense most importantly, especially for this audience, there's the, an absolute need for international mobilization of citizens of goodwill around the world. If you look at other struggles that are similar to this, the South African case is the, is the closest precedent that there is. The breakthrough in South Africa, the ending of in South Africa, did not happen because of the armed struggle and what we said to it. It wasn't that. It wasn't certainly because of what the ANC was doing internally, although that was important. It was finally what, what made what brought about change at the end was the intervention of other states and the governments, because they were always the last to come around to this kind of thing. It was non it was the the, 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 the nonviolent participation of ordinary citizens around the world who just said enough is enough and who imposed the boycott and sanction movement on South Africa in the 1970s and 80s, which really, first of all, brought around the Western states, the US and UK in particular, and then ultimately made the South African government change. I think the single most important in bringing about change in Palestine today has to come from citizens of goodwill around the world through the BDS movement. I can't think of any alternative right now, non violent alternative in any case. It's the only thing. That's what worked before. It has to work in this case. And I think I mean, as the panel yesterday demonstrated, there's a lot of evidence that the BDS movement is accelerating, especially in places like Europe, which we have to remember is actually Israel's biggest trading partner in many senses, um, and also around the world, Australia, other places as well, South Africa, for example. And I think it's beginning to take off in the US as well. The last thing I want to say is that in moments of despair and darkness, we have to remember also that when transformation happens, it happens very, very, very quickly. Things that were unimaginable one year become reality the next year. If you, if you, like for example, if you had said about South Africa in, I don't know, 1985, that in a few years apartheid would be ended and Nelson Mandela would be president, people would have said, you want to start raving lunatic. And yet, it happened. And it happened because of outside intervention of ordinary people, which is really the most important thing. The US government is not going to change. Barack Obama, I know him personally, he's not going to change. Uh, the Congress is not going to change, not yet. I mean, those, those things will all happen later. What can change, because nobody can stop it, is ordinary people engaging in BDS. If that happens, change will come about, I think, very quickly. And I think there's every sign that is happening and accelerating around the world. Yeah.
said it better than I could. The country 
was very, very, very reluctant to give up its, give up its privileges to what it considered to be, as Burke put it, the swinish multitude, that is, the, the common people. But eventually it did. And it did not because you know, they read Tom Paine's Rights of Man and were persuaded by the arguments. They did because there was a massive struggle that forced them to do so. If you look at South Africa, white South African, the, the apartheid regime didn't give up apartheid because it was the right thing to do. They gave it up because they had to. If you look at the south of the U.S., either in Jim Crow or even before, in, in, under actual outright slavery, slavery wasn't dismantled because white slave owners felt, you know, this is, this is I, my, my heart bangs, you know, I'm going to give up slavery. They did it because they had to. So there is never a case where a privileged group just gives up privileges because it's the right thing to do. They have to always be compelled to do so. And it's going to be the same case in the case of Israel. They have to be compelled to do so. And the compulsion that I believe in is not a violent compulsion, which is why I think BDS is the most obvious way, the most obvious strategy for those things to pursue. It's not violent, it doesn't hurt anybody, but it is extremely persuasive, as the South African case proved. When Israeli football teams can no longer compete in you know, the World Cup, let's say, or UEFA championships, when the Israeli tennis team can't play in the Davis Cup, when Israel, this is a little not fun fact, but when Israel can no longer send somebody to the Eurovision Song Contest, they'll be very depressed, I think. And I think they'll quickly start to realize, maybe not, maybe not about the Eurovision Song Contest, but you know, the World Cup, probably, in the UEFA, and other things too. But I mean, they'll realize we can't, you know, as South Africans did too, we can't go on living in isolation as a pariah state. And I think they will very quickly, since they are, as you're saying, almost all of them, like every other people in the world, normal people who just want to get on with their lives, once they start paying a price for what they're doing, I think they'll very quickly come around because your paying price is unpleasant. And they'll be made, to, they are already being made to pay a price, and they will continue to be pay a price in terms of isolation from the rest of the world. Um, the example that I've given before, and I, I'll, I should, didn't have the slide, but I could have showed it to you, uh, it's my favorite example because it's so graphic, is of the 2009 Davis Cup match between Israel and Sweden, the tennis match, which was originally supposed to be played in Stockholm, and it was moved at the last minute to Malmö because the authorities feared demonstrations outside the stadium. So the Davis Cup match unfolded with the Israeli and the, ten and the Swedish tennis player playing this really, really important tennis match in a totally empty stadium. There's a picture of the stadium on the inside, just, just the two guys playing tennis. I guess there's a, a referee or an umpire, whatever they call it. And then there's nobody else. It's completely empty. It's a big stadium. And then outside the stadium, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of protesters saying it shouldn't even be happening like that. So that it's visible, this sense of isolation is built, but Israelis don't like it. And when they feel the pressure, since they're normal, they will, I think, they're going to have to say, look, we can keep these privileges and be isolated from the rest of the world forever, or we could say, you know what, let's just be normal and get on with our lives and, you know, accede to the fact that we live in a world in which all people are equal, and we have to be equal to not super to anybody else. I think that'll happen. I think people grow up very fast. I think most people are normal people. They want to get on with their lives. They don't want to 
you know, they don't have kind of ideological commitment that costs them normal life in, in almost all cases. So maybe these Palestinians, anybody else for that matter, I think they're normal people. So I mean, I think you're right. I'm not surprised. I should add, by the way, and this is also extraordinary. I think if you think about its ramifications, that um, if you ask Palestinians in the West Bank who suffered enormously under occupation, what's the solution? I mean, whatever I asked, and they, almost everybody asked when I was there last time, said, one state, there's just no, there's no alternative. We're, they're here, we're here, we've got to just have to get on with it, basically. And, you know, I think it's obvious. It's, it really is obvious. You know, there's just no, no question about it. Tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, sorry, um, I agree with you. I, there's no way there could be two states. Um, and I agree with you that under, as Lee said, under one state, eventually they'll be forced. I mean, they're not, they're going to go kicking and screaming from the apartheid state. Hopefully, eventually that will change. But how do you visualize that they could actually end up with one state? Because every time you mention it, they say, oh no, Israel will never allow that to happen. So unless they decide to annex all of it and do it that way, how do you imagine that it could happen, that there could be one state? Well, I mean, in the sense that there is already one state. Sure, I know. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, we, we try to think, there's also, the whole, I mean, people like, the, like, you know, Norman Finkelstein and others have gone about the two state and how realistic it is. If you think about it, there is only one state. There aren't six states. There's one state that controls, that controls all the land we're talking about here. The, the problem with the state is that whether it's on the borders with regard to refugees or within the 67 borders with regard to its, 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 you know, its official Palestinian citizens, or with regard to guys like the West Bank, and so forth, it operates this system of apartheid that, that varies according to the specific population being targeted by apartheid mechanisms. Um, so, the, you know, what needs to be done is for the state to be made a democratic and secular state, to be reconstituted as a democratic state. So again, the president of South Africa, it seems like an obvious case in point. I mean, South Africa didn't want to change. It was compelled to change, and it did change. And I think it would be basically the same situation here. All those little funny understands I mean, they disappeared because they were, of course, fictive. You know, they weren't real. Um, and 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 you know, then there was one state in South Africa, not two states and six states, and you know, one state and ten understands or whatever. There was one state. I think it'll be the same thing in this case too. You, you know, I, I can't predict with any certainty, but. That's my sense. And they, they didn't have APEC, though. They didn't have as much support in the United States against any kind of justice for Palestinians. So That's true. They didn't have APEC. But I think, you know, I think APEC is very powerful. But I also think sometimes people over, overestimate the power of you know, what one lobby can do against the goodwill of tens of millions of decent people. OK, so you think maybe one day Israel will say, OK, all right. We've taken it all, so let's make it one state. They might just do that. I think, I think a transformation will will happen. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if it's going to look like that particularly, but I think, mm -hmm. I think it will happen. Yeah, I think it's like I said, all the other cases that happen. I don't see why this case should be exceptional. It's not going to happen. That's just what I think. You. Uh, thank you. Uh, you talk, sorry, I, I, I'm interested in, in these sort of kind of alternate spaces. Um, both resistance and occupation that it shows that it's not just uh, about sort of machine guns and being out on the street and those, those scenes of violence that we get on the news, but the, I think it's really interesting the way that you showed us this example of the trees. This, again, and you're, you're familiar with the, the, the sort of analogies to South Africa, but interesting example is Johannesburg is talked about as one of the sort of largest urban forests, right? And again, a project of the, of the National Party there, all of which were sort of non-indigenous species, right? So you see all these trees across Johannesburg that, are, that don't belong there, it's like still to this day. And part of the kind of post-apartheid and apartheid resistance movement was, was a planting of indigenous species across South, South Africa. Another analogy I'm wondering about, if you, if you could talk about, is sort of other spaces of resistance at the end. I'm thinking about in South Africa, that trade unions were actually uh, very much responsible in, in a lot of ways for, for bringing down apartheid, their, their collaboration with different with parties, but also, you know, the, just the, the strength of the trade union in South Africa. Are there sort of, are there these economic groups uh, functioning within the state? Are there Palestinian trade unions, things like this happening uh, at that level? Are there organizations of, of workers that are, in which the resistance is playing out? 
There are there are very there are very uh, active Palestinian civil society groups. I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of such groups inside Israel and in the in the Turkish and of course in exile as well. And they are very active. They're very vigilant. And they, and they they play an extraordinary role. I mean, the the whole boycott call came from Palestinian civil society organizations, all of them, basically all of them together in a unified voice. So I think that does exist. I think it is very important. Um, but I also think it's very important, if you look at what, what's been happening in the Arab world the past year or longer, the sense of possibility about how to bring about transformation is, is extremely, you know, it's very visible, it's very, uh, it's almost visceral across the Arab world, including among the Palestinians. So it seems to me very clear that there's a sense that people have that transformation can be brought about, whether it's a combination of civil society or unions, sort of organizations like that, or Mass protests, and that's, that's not necessarily you know centralized or hierarchized in any kind of way, because those prove to be extremely effective. There's like Tunis and Egypt. Um, you know, what what the long term consequences of Tunis and Egypt we don't yet know, but at least they brought about you know incredible transformation uh, given all the circumstances that were that, you know the, the facts that they were up against. So I think there's there's that same sense too that that NGOs and civil society on the one hand and decentralized mass protests on the other hand among Palestinians, who are a very mobilized population in general. I mean, not necessarily the hardships they, but they live under, under occupation. Um, can, will, can, are they role, can they role, can they role, and I think will together bring about the kind of transformation we're looking to. Also building with networks inside and among Israeli protesters. Like, for example, all the protests up and down the length of the, of the wall involve both Palestinian protesters and Israeli protesters, and Jewish Israeli protesters, and, of course, international protesters. Well, I think that, that triangle will continue to expand, and I, and I, I have faith in that. Um, also, I just want to make a quick announcement. There's a sign-up sheet being passed around. If you could sign that, that would be great. Um, any more questions? Sandra, have a question. Well, I have what I suppose is an existential question, and one concern, and that is, let's say that this one Various forms of um, 
the various processes that one can imagine culturally speaking to overcome those forms of enmity and politicization, truth and reconciliation, and that kind of thing. But, you know, yeah, you know, we live in the world we live in, and that's what we have to make do with. Is it going to be perfect? No, but it's certainly a lot better than what we have now. And we have to accept those limitations and, you know, hope for the best in most people being normal people and get on with it. I mean, I just look at the mere fact that last time I was in the West Bank, I spoke to, I said, you know, as you know, I spoke to all kinds of people from ambulance drivers who were pulling dismembered bodies out of the ruins of buildings that the Israelis had bombed or demolished, to people who lost children, to people who lost parents, to people who suffered unimaginable lives in places like Khafidi or elsewhere in the West Bank, Khalid, Ebra. I mean, it's unimaginable what those people have been through. And yet, I'm talking to them as a Palestinian to another Palestinian in Arabic. Not like I'm, you know, I'm not a visiting diplomat or whatever. I'm one of them in that sense. And asking them, well, what do you think the future is? I mean, can we, can we live with these people? Can you live with these people? And like I said, with one exception, literally one exception, which was qualified, in fact, <coughs> they all said, yeah, of course. This is, that's what we have to do. So, you know, if the guy in Nablus who spent weeks pulling out bodies from under the rubble, an ambulance driver, can say that about the people you know who are causing him to pull out bodies from ruins. If he can embrace them, if he has it in his heart to do so, I don't want to question that. I want to say, you know, I'm going to affirm that. That is remarkable, I think. And I think there's every reason to expect that most Palestinians and most Israelis are, will, will be able to overcome. You know, although I'm going to take your point, I'm going to dismiss your point. It's an important point. But we have no choice. We, we have no choice in that sense, yeah. I mean, we have to do what we can to overcome those kinds of problems, I think. Without, without saying that they're just going to disappear all that, because they're not. We'll just take up the last few questions. Yeah. Yes, um, this is kind of what is a response to many of the previous, or the of the previous questions that were asked earlier. Um, you mentioned that Actually, from a Palestinian point of view, 
I think the kind of burning energy of nationals, you know, that sort of nationals, those nationals discourses and paradigms, I think they're, they've been dead for a long time. I think Palestinians have been looking for ways of imagining alternatives to that understanding of nationalist struggle. Which is why I think the whole one state movement is much more noticeable among Palestinians than it is among Israelis. Although there are reasons for that too, I mean, other than what I'm just saying now. But I think more and more Palestinians are able to countenance a struggle that's based on rights rather than on national identity as such. So, I mean, I see Palestinians actually moving beyond nationalism very, very quickly, if they haven't already done so. And many more will come around to the, you know, as I think, toward the future, right? Um, I mean, I can't speak about the, the Jewish or the Jewish Israeli experience, uh, except insofar as to say, uh, you know, nationalism has its kind of currents that, you know, get get channeled in certain directions and then might get channeled in certain other directions when, when you know, it is contingent to change. So I think that's going to have to be a case like that. But of course, I mean, now the question I want to ask to all the human turn is, you know, it's it's very easy to say, well, what about this and what about that, what about this and what about that? I'm not denying any of this and the that, all of the race, but those are important, this and the that. So, but on the other hand, let's come back to what I was talking about. The situation we're in now. We need an alternative to the situation we're in now. And for all the endless lists of this is and that's that we can come up with, which I don't deny it there, you know, I think we have to work with those this is and that's and worry about them, but I also think we have to have a sense of, well, what do we have in mind ultimately is a kind of just peace. And, you know, on those grounds, I think the one state is, is you know, the obvious case to make. But I think then we have to try and find ways to, to reconcile that this isn't about the, 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 the questions that are being raised, which are all the human questions, with this larger vision of a just peace. And ask ourselves, well, what would the, you know, if that just peace comes about, and there are all these the qualms and the, the this isn't that that we're all raising, would the circumstance of a just peace actually change the playing field in such a way that the this isn't that might actually look very different afterwards than they do now, sort of prospectively, you see what I mean? I mean, if you imagine, for instance, a Middle East in which there's no war, in which the Israeli-Palestinian struggle is over, and there is no Arab Israeli, and it's gone, it's finished, it's over, the case closed, chapter you know, done, move on to a new chapter, the entire region, what would the Middle East look like without war? I mean, just let's think about that for a moment. What kind of vision does that open? What kind of movements across borders that are now so written in iron and stone and blood that wouldn't have to be anymore in the way that they are now, certainly? What kind of economic development, what kind of cultural movements take place? I mean, there's a lot that would change in that part of the world and with it the rest of the world. If you think about the way in which the struggles in the Middle East have a, such a deleterious impact on the entire planet in all kinds of ways, Imagine that's removed, how the entire planet would look differently. I think we also have to anticipate these kinds of questions in that other changed context, not just the context that we're stuck in now. So the future creates its own futures, in effect. And you know, we have to look towards that rather than rather than uh, trying to, I'm not saying any of you are doing this, of course, but rather than trying to worry about uh, the, the interpreting the future in light of the present. You know, I think this change brings change, and it's to that that we have to look, because that's how it has always happened historically. Thank you. Thank you. So, one last question. Um, I think you had your hand up. Fundamental question. I think there are two things you can do. One is adjust your own 
I don't know about Coca-Cola in particular, like for example, Starbucks is an example where I personally want that not only because it's more digital, but it makes terrible espresso. <laughs> but I mean, those kinds of choices, you know, that's my own personal opinion. But I think those kinds of choices one can make in one's day-to-day -day life. But I think one can also get involved with more organized forms of protest, uh, you know, that are, that are all around us. And I think the BDS, will be part of what it's done is it's it's been effective because it's able to target specific uh, companies, for example, Motorola or Veolia, the French transport company that's built into light rail network in the West Bank. Um, and those, in other situations, like in, you know, stripping Veolia of contracts in other parts of the world, the company has lost much more money as a result of the BDS movement than it's made on this stupid light rail project that it got itself involved in. And it rules the day that it got involved in that contract. So, um, the BDS people here can tell you more about the anti violia movements that are going on in L.A. now, because there's a protest against Violia, I think, this weekend. Talk to me on your way out. Yeah, very, very <laughs> so I think, I mean, I think that's what it means. You need a combination of personal action, but also focused, more organized action, where well. both things matter. And then, I, finally, what I think is also very important is for people to speak, to read, and to write. And I think all of us should, should, should do that. We speak to each other, but also speak publicly, write you know, to newspapers or online or whatever, because I think that makes a difference. It has shown itself to make a difference. And the example I can give, in fact, I can speak from personal experience here, is the one state solution. Because, you know, one state solution, it's, I don't know if you notice, it's all the buzz. Everybody's talking about the one state solution. It's become kind of the, the thing that people are either talking about because they want to or saying, it's terrible, it's horrible, or as Stephen Stein said the other day, it's a cult or a pipe dream. Or something. So, I mean, people, it's, everybody's talking about it now. But I know, personally, that the ones, the whole idea of a one-state solution in its, you know, post-1970s formation, which is a few years ago, was put on the world agenda by a few people, of whom I, I think I know them all, and I want them. I mean, literally, you know, it's not, I'm not trying to, you know, empire but I'm just saying it's extraordinary what a few people writing in very visible places like, like global newspapers and about international media outlets, but people who don't have a political position, they don't have a party affiliation, they're not connected to authorities, and in fact they're writing against the US, the UN, the EU, the Israelis, the PLO, the PA. They're saying we defy all that, this is what we want. They're able to put that on the world agenda, and it's now the subject of everyday debate. When you raise the question of Palestine, one state, two state comes up automatically, and that was put on the world agenda by a dozen people. Which is an extraordinary thing to think about it. So it's amazing what communication can do and what kinds of difference people who write make. So I encourage you also to write. That's what I would say.